Geneva. And uh, actually me and my colleague Patricia will both be kind of presenting today. And just to tell you guys like the format we're going to do because it's going to be interactive. So please uh, don't give us a wall of silence when we say, so oh, we'd like to hear your opinion. Um, I think Patricia will give a very, very brief overview of like what is the Women's Participation Project, which has been going for about seven, eight years now. And um, and then talk about this kind of big report that we've done. And then I'm going to talk about um, the findings we've had, but not in great detail, more share them. And then I'll put it back to you and say, how have you guys dealt with these problems? What solutions have you found when engaging with the community on these issues? So we're really not going to do a long presentation. I'm hoping it will be a lot of back and forth using kind of our project as a as a guide for the discussion. I think that would be more interesting for everyone. So. Unless you guys want a one hour PowerPoint presentation, uh, we can do that. Just kidding. OK, so voila, I'll hand over to Patricia just for one or two minutes to introduce the project so we all know what we're talking about. Uh, over to you, Patricia. Thanks, uh, Kevin, and thanks, Christine. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Patricia. I work in the global CCCM team uh, here in, in headquarters with IOM. Um, I work specifically in the Women's Participation Project together with Kevin, Amalia and Isel also that recently uh, joined the team. Um, and yeah, just to share that the project um, started in 2016. Uh, it is part of a global initiative that is called uh, Safe from the Start. Um, that started in 2015. The aim of this uh, global initiative is to reduce GBV risk, and it has different components. No? So each component uh, does it in its own way. Um, there is, for example, the localization component that is strengthen uh, local capacities uh, by training uh, local actors, for example, no, in GBV. And the way the women's participation, for example, does it is by increasing the participation of women and girls uh, in camps and camps like settings. Um, we have been doing this since uh, 2016. As I said, we started um, with uh, five countries, Iraq, Nigeria, Philippines, South Sudan and Ecuador. Just to mention also that this project started in coordination with the Women Refugee Commission and the CCCM cluster. Um, and yeah, since there, uh, we have been working in more than 13 countries. Uh, at the moment, the project is active in six of them. We are already in phase uh, nine of the of this global initiative, and now we are uh, active in Cox's Bazar, where, for example, Emmy. Uh, has uh, experience working in the WPP before. We are also working in, in Mozambique uh, with our colleague Monese that is there also. Um, we are working also in South Sudan, uh, Nigeria, Somalia and Yemen. Uh, some of the colleagues uh, will be joining also during this session to give us feedback on some of the activities that they are doing uh, at this moment. Um, last year, uh, end of last year and beginning of this year, a project review, as um, Kevin was mentioning, uh, was done to understand what has been the what have been the achievements and of course also the challenges of the implementation of the project in the last uh, seven years. Um, then it was done through, of course, a uh, revision of a lot of um, reports and baseline assessment and lines assessment and as well as some um, key informant interviews and consultations with people that has been involved in the project. Uh, these findings were presented during a global workshop that was done in March. And yeah, the findings will be shared now by by Kevin. Thanks uh, again. Uh, the report is a separate document which we'll share probably on the forum, not immediately, but in the near future. So um, yeah. Um, now we're going to transition and hopefully have some discussion. And I know this is the community engagement forum, not the women's participation forum or the, the CCCM forum. So we've kind of tried to tailor our questions and what we want to talk about to the community engagement side of things. Um, so there were a few key findings in this big uh, review report that we did. And one of them, uh, we'll start with that. So start thinking about uh, your own work in community engagement was about women's participation and leadership, more importantly. 
so in all the countries that we implemented um, the WPP, women were able to be involved in camp management and governance within the camp at some level. Uh, in the best cases, they were able to kind of achieve leadership positions within the camp. Um, we found that this was mostly achieved by mobilizing the whole community to support women, women's committees, or by introducing kind of formal quotas uh, for women in the decision making forums. In other words, you must have a certain number of women uh, in order to form your governing council for the camp or something like this. In addition, trainings and workshops for women, which focused on developing confidence, leadership skills, communication skills, all helped. Um, but of course, meaningful women's participation uh, in their communities, in these leadership positions in camps, is still a challenge. Um, restrictive norms that kind of perpetuate male authority and decision making and a perception among women that they are, we can say, uh, unable to participate due to lack of confidence or illiteracy, um, limited time due to household responsibilities, all kind of were continuous challenges over the, over the seven years. Um, in some very restrictive contexts, women and girls are even unable to move outside the house without a man to escort them. So we're talking about, you know, women's leadership uh, in, in camp settings. So I want to ask you, all of you community engagement people, in your work, what are the major challenges that you've encountered in getting women involved in leadership positions for your projects? Doesn't have to be CCCM, could be, but when you're working with communities, how do you ensure that the women in those communities are also involved in leading, steering things, and so forth. What solutions have you found to those challenges too? Uh, that's the first question I'd like to ask all of you. Any thoughts? If not, I can assume you've all had a very easy time involving the whole community uh, and your community engagement projects all over the world. Um, I mean, I have my own stories from my my work in the field, but I'd be very curious to hear those of you who are currently there. I have uh, so. Am I? Go ahead, as Lana. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's me. I will be actually. I'll be a little bit provocative. Uh, I didn't have the best time of my life, like uh, working with in community, but. To be honest, uh, the most uh, big experience that I have is working with uh, Latin American women in Brazil or Costa Rica, Honduras, and uh, and they are really strong women. And and for me, it was 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 the best. So that's why I'm trying to raise a little bit like the Latin America also community. But my my question, my question or my response here, or uh, what I want to to provoke is that sometimes we face, I face it, lots of difficulties in coordination because uh, mo also most of my work I was uh, in the coordination level. So I was dealing not exactly directly with the communities, but with other colleagues, UN colleagues or in, uh, uh, NGO colleagues. And I did have difficulties myself to express myself or to, to, to open my, my, my space. And I am a Latina, like as the other Latin Americans that I work with, I am an, also a Latin American woman and I, I think I'm really strong and I impose myself a lot. But um, my provocation here is how can we kind of balance uh, this word that we still have lots of empowered men, kind of like, uh, like blocking our voices even in the UN system, even in like safe spaces as we have here. So I'm like being, whew, <laughs> that's it, over from my side. Uh, I'll just add that is even something the report found that even in the implementing teams, there was a, a resistance or difficulty in, in exactly what you're describing. So yeah, but I would be curious to hear what others have to say because it's probably not for me to answer. Um, Sorry, Kevin, do you see the raised hands or is it only me as a moderator? I see Elena yes, and Emmy. I do. Uh, I think, Emmy, you raised your hand first. Oh, no, it's we have numbers. Elena, you're next. Thanks. Um, I also have a bit of a provocative um, 
episode that happened in a, I want I will not say the country, in a camp I was working on and we were starting operation and um, we were looking for a um, community mobilizer and it was um, a camp where it was really difficult to hire and also engage with women. Um, so to make sure we had women um, community mobilizer, girl community mobilizer, um, I had asked my um, officer, my uh, camp officer, to go to a um, female-friendly space and uh, inform uh, the female-friendly state staff that we were looking for community mobilizers. So if he could pass, uh, like he, she, I don't remember, um, who was managing the uh, the women, the female-friendly space, could pass the message to uh, the women uh, if they were interested in in um, in this role they could come to the camp management office. And the reply uh, that we got was that, oh, don't hire women, they are lazy. And this was, um, I guess, like someone who was working in the female friendly space. So uh, also a very provocative uh, episode, but it happened. And um, just to say that, yeah, sometimes it, we work in very, uh, um, culturally restrictive environments where some, uh, um, biased are also um, biased that how our colleagues have. So yeah, just uh, just another yeah provocative episode that from the real life though. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Bill. Um, being provocative also leads to better conversation and more honest conversation. So I think it's good. Uh, Emmy, you're next. I don't think my one is that provocative, but it's a very recent example. I think even just from yesterday, um, we didn't like the WPP. We are doing some activities for participation of uh, women here and uh, in different sites and various sites. And uh, we are trying to make it really participatory. We are trying to make women to uh, decide everything, select everything, um, like uh, choose projects, etc. But we have been getting feedback in the beginning of the all sessions that um, they would prefer if we make the selection. They don't want to make a selection, actually. Um, so we spend a lot of time to explain why we want them to make a selection, not us. Um, so I think it's uh, sometimes particip like we always believe that participation is going to be uh, straightforward or even something that they would desire uh, always. But it's uh, it takes time even to, I think, develop this perspective of no, they can participate and uh, it's totally OK and it's not us to make the decisions. So it's one example. And the second example, which is a bit more like uh, which was, a, I think, struggle for me in Cox's Bazaar and I believe for most of the colleagues, sometimes to increase the um, woman's participation, uh, you need to get consent from the husband, um, like in in some context and Cox's Bazaar was one of them for some cases and uh, we were even writing some guidelines about increasing the women's participation in data collection and um, and technically one of the cultural guidelines is to go to the husband and ask for consent to survey uh, his wife or his daughter but it's also kind of reinforcing the norms that we are trying to kind of break and so it was it was one of the biggest struggles i guess for us always to just do do things culturally appropriate but also somehow create some change for female participation at the same time so these are just two points that i wanted to raise you've brilliantly uh, helped us move to the the next point which is about engaging men uh, and and boys and other gatekeepers um I'll come to, but thanks, thanks for sharing. Yeah, um, I think I'll add to summarize what some of you are saying. I mean, when I joined the Women's Participation Project very recently, you know, I remember my first thoughts were, you know, it's very difficult to engage women and girls in participation and in communities where they're displaced and in um, communities where maybe normally it's just um, cultural norms aren't um, um, already set up for that. But reality, women's participation in leadership is something everywhere, I remember thinking. We talk about it in corporate boardrooms, in governments, in parliaments, in basically every country in the world. And, you know, some sort of equality at minimum, you know, 50-50 in terms of real um, 
women's participation probably hasn't been reached almost anywhere. I mean, there's a few countries, but anyways, I think my main reflection was this is an issue everywhere. We're just talking about it in kind of displacement context. So, okay. Thanks, you guys, for sharing. Uh, there's just two more kind of points that we'll cover, uh, and so please uh, continue to share. So the second finding um, from the report was about, yeah, engaging gatekeepers, uh, as we call them in the report, but it's uh, mainly men and boys. You know, when you're talking about women's participation, how do you engage the, the men and boys? So all of the implementing countries that we worked in found that using some sort of model of champions of change, you know, the men or advocates among the male community who can promote women and girls participation was effective or could be effective. This was one thing that was found. Uh, some of the major successes, successes that the different countries found were achieved by kind of targeting male gatekeepers, as we will call them, like religious leaders or alternatively establishing groups for fathers or husbands or male teachers so that they can support each other as men and boys in advocating for women's participation. So that's where some of the successes were achieved when these models were used. However, of course, engaging men and boys in the project continues to be a challenge um, across all implementing countries for you know, a lot of the factors that many of you know already and encounter. So I want to ask you guys, when you are doing your community engagement projects, and let's say you just want to involve women, it's not even talking about leadership or anything, but how do you ensure buy-in from the whole community, especially from men and boys uh, in communities where that's kind of required. How do you engage with them? How do you get their yeah, buy-in on these types of projects? Because it's it's kind of about power and relinquishing some of that, and it's very difficult, I think. So any success stories or just challenges you want to share that you've encountered? Yes, uh, Abraham, go ahead. Okay, hi Kevin. So um, I would be talking for NRC Nigeria. So most most of the times when we go for 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 projects that has to do with community engagement, that women would be really we really need women to participate in this kind of activities. We do uh, before before kick started the project, we do a, a visit to the communities of of, of focus or community will be targeting. So there's an entry entry point which we inform them of what the project is, who is supposed to be targeted, percentage of men to women. So if we do that uh, in the beginning of the project and mid-year, maybe, maybe like a follow-up meeting with them. Okay, this is uh, how we intend to do in this project. We intend to target, if we're targeting, let's say, uh, 100 project participants, we, we need 40 to be females and maybe uh 60 to be male so there's a there's a review at the mid of the year while the project is going then we let them know okay this is the percentage of women that have uh, been targeted and so far we are at this level so with that uh, regular engagement we get we tend to get more women to participate however sometimes it's very challenging just as some of the colleagues mentioned sometimes when you try engaging women they, they there's a level of permission they need to get from their husbands and so on and so forth. So it's a bit challenging, but at least it's somehow working. Yeah. OK. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, but Anyone I else? Something, but I cannot raise my hand for, I mean, I cannot okay. find the hand. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Go okay. ahead, Jackson. Hi, by the okay. way. Nice to see yeah, you. Hi. Nice to see you. So I, what I, we usually do, and I found this in some community, so woman participation put the main in general, they would be afraid of competition. And that's really important to notice because men will be like, who owns, who's this NGO or NGO or this program for bringing women to be a breadwinner or what are they teaching our women? And I've seen this in many communities. I mean, I work in a few places, but I really read a lot of reports. So basically with the approach we did, we did it in Syria. We did it actually in Jordan. Is we go to the woman to, uh, to the male. We go to the men in the area. We don't forget about women. Of course, the focus is women. But who's your challenge? It's the male community. So we go to male and men in the area. 
we sit with them and we show, we talk to them and we tell them what's the value of having the woman to participate in such a program. And it seems like more, in most cases, they are against it because they don't understand what the value is. They would be like, who's those outsiders coming from sometimes Western countries or with Western ideas coming to our culture to ruin our values. So that's why we see a resistance. But if we go to the community and we target the, not the woman, even though the program is targeting the woman, the other side is like the male uh, people in the community, and they explain to them, we will not see any resistance. Or I will say we will have different kinds of resistance and then we'll be successful in that uh, program. I know if it makes sense, but we usually target yeah. men more than women to enable to be successful as a woman in the program. Yeah, so it sounds like the argument you're sort of making to these to the men in this case is that somehow it will benefit you or your family at least um, yeah. as a way to start the process. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, Emmy, you want to say something else? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add something. Not only I think the buy-in from men is very important, not only to ensure participation, but also for the process after, because there's also empirical evidence that when women fail in the activities that they join just be, because they are women in women activities and from development context, for example, small entrepreneurship, when women fail, it increases GBV in the household because like it's um, they say that you look you couldn't succeed um i mean you spent so much time on it even sometimes you spent resources but you couldn't succeed so i think it's really important to have the buy-in of men and men to understand the processes and even likelihood of uh, failure in the end of some projects not everything can achieve to everything that has been put as a goal um it's really important to avoid uh, any 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 stress or any pressure in the later stages, which even includes us hiring female staff, but then somehow because of budget cuts, letting them go in a couple of months, which even is which is even something that we need to consider when making all these plans of uh, hiring female staff, because we don't know what it can lead to in the household in the in the later stages. So it sounds like almost, you know, if Yaksan saying we need to engage the men in, in one argument can be it will benefit you or your household, you're saying probably a second important part is even if it doesn't benefit or it, or it finishes or fails at some point, there's still a benefit or this is still a thing to, to support. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, anyone else want to add on, on this topic of engaging sort of the men and boys in your community engagement projects or work? All right. Well, thanks to the to those. Oh, yes. I know if I wait long enough, someone will raise their hand. So, OK, Thomas. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, just a quick observation going back to your first point as well. But I think it comes into all of this. Um, I think one of the biggest gatekeepers to success that I've seen in places I've worked is is with male staff and how they communicate with everyone around women's engagement projects Sim often because even when they are um good honest hard-working people that um that believe in um what wpp is and what it should be is that they sim they simply lack the the belief that it can be successful um there, so there's a sort of there's an inbuilt cynicism that um i think often got in the way of of making progress um and yeah i just wanted to drop yeah, that one in i think i don't know the numbers but i mean whether it's in international staff national staff un ngos i don't know what the the numbers are on people in leadership uh men and women but i'm sure these beliefs extend across all those spectrums you know um so yeah i mean yeah, here I am a man talking about these things, so I'm happy that others have joined in. OK, so we just have a third um, and final. Uh, conclusion from the report, a finding from the report that we want to share. This one is uh, more about economic or uh, income generating activities and livelihoods. So put your income generating activities hat on. 
So uh, what did we find or what did the report find? Um, well, in the design of the women's participation project originally, empowering women economically was kind of theorized as a way to enhance their social capital of women and thereby enhance their participation. If we empower women economically, their participation will be able to be enhanced too. That was the theory. Uh, after the seven years, it, uh, we found that multiple pilot projects with income generating activities and so forth, it was pretty effective. Uh, some of the many income generating activities in our project included, I'll just list a few, um, skill building and training in things like jewelry making, basket weaving, and this is important what I'm listing here, so pay attention, basket weaving, food processing, goat rearing, fish net manufacturing, soap making, sewing, tailoring, and others. Um, and the successful ones were kind of led by women's committee members and so forth. Uh, the women learned new skills, benefited from the income, but they also built kind of a system of support among other women doing these activities and were able to participate more. Um, there were challenges sort of in maybe scaling them up um, and how they would continue after the project support ended. Um, and those were challenges that we've tried to uh, address or will be addressing going forward. For example, you know, if we distributed sewing machines in Bangladesh in our project, they had positive outcomes, but when some of the machines broke, it wasn't budgeted in to repair them and so forth. So continuing these kind of income generating projects. And I'm not going to ask you, how have you empowered women by using income generating activities? I want to open it up a bit more because I think it's a more interesting question. Um, and I think, um, who did you have on two months ago, uh, Kristen, from Yemen or somewhere talking about this? Or was it that not the right country? Uh, Walid? Yeah, was it Yemen or no? He was from Yemen, yeah. He yeah, was from Yemen. Presenting okay. the community-led project guidelines. Yeah, okay. And he talked a bit about, I think, these kinds of things. So my question for all of you uh, about this. When you want to do livelihood activities with your communities you're working with, and I assume because you're community engagement people, you go to them and ask, what would you like to do maybe, or how would you like to be involved in it? How do you broaden the ideas that you get or get innovative ideas? Because many of the things I just listed, you know, when we reflected on them are things that we've probably seen a thousand times, sewing, uh, you know, tailoring, um, small activities like that. So, and some of these, you know, the humanitarian community has been doing for, for for decades. Not to say they don't work, but um, could we be doing things different? Have you been able to elicit more interesting ideas from the community? I'll give you one example that we did find in our project in South Sudan. So South Sudan Women's Participation Project first did some workshops on, can we call it climate change, um, the environment, all these sorts of things, and kind of helped make the community aware that this is a problem and something that is changing in the world. And then later on, they were asking for ideas about um, income generating activities. And one of the ideas suggested by the community was, well, the areas around this camp in a place called Bentu in South Sudan has been flooded for the last several years, which never happened before, completely flooded. And so they thought, why don't we do something innovative and build floating gardens to grow food even when everything is completely underwater and that was the project so they built these floating gardens using kind of local methods with some support from the project um, and that was something we never saw before in our income generating activities but it was because we had kind of done some uh, groundwork before okay i think you get the point but i'm we're mainly asking how have you managed to get more innovative ideas from the communities you work with for income generating uh, stuff Any thoughts? You know, something different from the usual sewing or uh, tailoring and stuff. OK, uh, Joy, I think you're not on video, but your hand is up. Go ahead. Uh, Joy, if you can hear me, you can unmute and go ahead. You're still on mute. Oh my God, so sorry. Good <laughs> now you're good. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, my name is Joy, Joy Dogo from IUM Nigeria. May do great to be precise. Um, at the moment, I think I'm in one of the locations where we do this implementation of the women activities, which is Guzai LGA. 
So last week, late last week, I was in the camp, um, GSS camp to be precise, and I have a chip chat with the women and the girls where we have set up a center for them for this tailoring. So I have a quick discussion with them um, towards the evening time because um, due to their farming activities, mostly they don't get to go to the center within the day except in the evening after they return from harvesting those crops. So I have a quick discussion with them. I told them that I want to discuss on how we are going to move the women participation forward because initially I understand we do the tailoring, we do the cap making, so they should come up with activities, activities that has to do with climate change and all that. Since um, we gradually are driving, we have some climate changes activities and those women came up with a very, very beautiful ideas. Some of them suggested the, that we want to see um, IOM empowering them for guardyard backing and um, gardening like irrigation farming within the space of their shelter where they can be able to plant some past crop like carrots, lettuce, cabbage and even watermelon depending on the space available for them. So um, then other parts of other set of the women also like suggested if we can be able to empower them with stuff like um, soap making, liquid soap making, then Vaseline since we are gradually approaching the cold season. And some of them also suggested if they can be able to do this briquette for cooking, it will also be a beautiful idea to them. So um, all this, all this ideas that this women brought to me, I think if we were able to give it a try, I think it, it will go a long way because um, like during the raining season, they find it difficult to go into the bush to get this firewood where they will come and do the cooking for them, for their family. But by the time we can be able to teach them how to do this brick it themselves, I think it's going to go a long way. Then some of those um, crops where if they plant it, they will be able to consume some and they will be able to sell some. The same thing with the other activities, other income generating activities where they mention, like the soap making, the liquid soap making, the vaseline and all that. I think it is a very beautiful idea because by the time we we'll come back to them to do this implementation, if only we want to do this implementation of these activities to them, what we normally do is we engage them in a small FGD conversation. We do a consultation with them. We draft out questions. We have a little conversation with them to get their own opinion because over the years, most of these activities where we implement for them, we help them implement. These activities were totally selected by them. There is no any other time that we have to say, this is what you guys have to do. These suggestions are coming up from them. So I like the fact that they were able to see the need for them to move, move away from the normal tailoring, even though they are doing beautiful well. They are really, really doing beautifully in the area of the tailoring, like they made suggestions whereby with the little amounts they make from this, putting up this clothes, they were able to feed their family. Some of them, we have a beautiful success story where some of them were able to send even their children to school. And as a result of this um, activities, the women, you see most of these women were able to come out from their fear. They will be able to come out from their shell what they were unable to do before. They will be able to stand within the crowd of people to talk, most especially in areas of sensitization, because these same women, we were able to empower them to carry out this sensitization themselves to the community by themselves. So you realize that um, truly the activities has 
really, really cut down their fears. It has put them in a place whereby they feel they feel love and they feel they belong to the community. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I, I didn't know that success story, but then again, I'm new to the project and you almost summarized. The yeah, the the, the theory of the economic empowerment, you know, they, they're empowered, they're enhanced their social and cultural capital, and then they'll be able to participate in a bigger way. And that's just what you described, gaining confidence and and so forth. So. Um, Elena, do you you're typing something, but do you want to share it? It's always hard to read the chat and talk or listen yeah. at the same time. Yeah, no, it's uh, I was just saying that sometimes it's also risky to try to have less, let's say, stereotypical project because maybe there won't be a market for it. I remember uh, in board the um, Korean battalion had a vocational center um, where they used to train both um, IDPs and host communities members. And in the bakery, the women used to do um, uh, chocolate chips, cookies and muffins. And I was uh, very happy. I had become manager having breakfast every day. But then again, there, there is not really market for muffins in bar as of now. So I was always wondering. Hmm, you mean there's no market since you left, do? since you left the bar? The since I left, here. since I left. I mean, like, yeah. Besides the the people living in the in the in the base in the humanitarian hub, there there wasn't a big market in bar for muffin at that time. Maybe maybe things changed. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so I was wondering how you know how people, how the trainees could have you know uh, used these skills in the end because it was very niche. So yeah, just sharing this experience. And I think yeah, you mentioned risky, and someone else had mentioned. Um, well, I don't know. The idea of risk I always find is important, uh, interesting in the aid sector because I think donors are very ad adverse to any project failing or sounding like it's failing. So uh, I think, well, one way we can do more innovative projects is by, you know, hopefully changing that culture, uh, you know, experimenting to fail and saying, well, failing is okay. Kind of like someone was just saying about if a woman starts a project and it fails and needing to educate her family and that's okay. Same for the humanitarian community, you know, try something innovative, making muffins or digital skills building, trying a digital income generating activity doesn't work. OK, we tried it, but what did we learn? We'll try it again somewhere else. So I think the idea of. Yeah, trying and failing is not super supported within the I think the wider. Humanitarian world as it is in, let's say, the private sector, but yes, Emmy. Um, sorry, I talked a lot today, but just one thing that uh, also I'm super new in Mozambique team, but uh, it has been very intense with WP recently with Mones. Uh, so one thing that we have been observing that we just did this like business pitching um, project uh, with the woman in different sites. So we did call for applications, then they came up with business ideas, then we did a very participatory selection of the project uh, with them. So we didn't select they selected basically but uh, what was really interesting to me and I think it was interesting to the team that uh, I don't know I would have I mean I, I think I I had my own assumptions and I was expecting more projects like the ones that you listed you know but uh, most of the projects were about trades and normally trade is seen as something that um, men do, I guess, in most contexts, you know, but uh, most of the projects were about trade, which is also linked to the current situation in Mozambique, which is that WFP almost cut all the food support and they are having trouble uh, fi finding food in the areas um, and they want to focus on bringing more food and opportunities to their sites for a bit uh, longer term um, and sustainable life standards. So they came up with like we we wanted them when opening this call for applications, we wanted them to focus on the needs of their communities and the uh, they imagined obviously much better than us um, and they all came up with different trade ideas to solve the problems of their sites. I think it's about a bit like not really directing them but uh, creating space for them to really be able to discuss uh, within themselves and uh, come up solutions to their own problems because I mean as we all know open communities know much more than us so instead of going with a like 
preset agenda and uh, I don't know, just uh, art pieces to create, which is also great. I'm not saying that they are bad at all, which is also great, which is something that we are doing here as well, but also giving them a bit more space to, to think and uh, produce, I guess. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, I just wanted to say, do you have to, do you want to say something? I, I don't know if you had to go at this point before we go over to Lana. Yes, um, thanks, Tom. Sorry, <laughs> thanks, Kevin. Just looking at Tom's uh, comment. I, I've been called <laughs> many names besides Kevin today, actually. It's not the first time, don't <laughs> worry. Uh, thanks um, for the chance to say goodbye. I, I actually, I have to run, guys, but um, uh, to pick up my son in school. And um, um, uh, Kevin has kindly said that he can continue um, uh, as long as you want to continue. So uh, I will leave so the recording doesn't just keep going after everyone has left eventually. Um, but um, thank you, Kevin. Thank you to Patricia and everyone for joining. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest via the recording. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, so we can stay on for another few minutes, uh, for, at least for Lana to, to say her piece. So uh, Lana, please go ahead. Uh, what did you no, the thing that about your question and to get good ideas, I think one of the, 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 the experiences that I have is involving local communities or involving it's the same as strategic that you mentioned about involving men in the projects also involving local communities because sometimes men and women from the local community or uh, partners or NGOs, local NGOs, uh, usually they, they, they know better what are the needs, a little bit like what Amy just said, they know better what are the needs and at the same time if we put money on that on their project or a small or they, we support their project um, we also increase that community. So going local, it's a bit, uh, it's a, it's a good way to get uh, good ideas uh, in to our projects, or at when least you, for me. When you say engage the local community, do you mean like in a in a camp or a site setting where you have a displaced population and a local community, or what did you mean by engaging the local community? Yeah, when sorry, I, 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 I didn't put like the local in Joe's. Uh, ah, engaging okay. or involving local NGOs uh, okay. and of course at the same time local communities because sometimes local NGOs they also involve local communities so it's kind of like the same but through local NGOs or local partners it helps a lot at least in my projects that I work with uh, it was really good way of having local different businesses ideas. too I mean I'm a, I'm not a businessman I've you know been doing nonprofit work my whole life and I sometimes forget that the private sector is you know the main thing in the world and there are local businesses everywhere who need skills people etc so yeah I would add that to your list I think but yeah totally totally right uh, Yaksan you have your hand up too yeah thank you Kevin I, I want to like uh, talk about the things we did in Turkey. We had a program for refugees in vocational training. For most of the women community, <clears throat> we just heard the typical programs like tailoring and uh, like uh, hair, hairdressing, coiffure, and other things. So what we did, and of course, men went to HVAC, uh, mechanic, and other uh, classes. But what we did, we had over number going to the like typical tailoring classes so what we did we want to do before we start the class we explain to the woman participants that it's a great you're in anyway but it's important to discover and know what the other classes is giving and what kind of opportunity because i mean going with the typical classes yes we're giving the woman opportunity but at the same time we just throw them in the market where they will not succeed. Honestly, in a way, I will not use the word lie, but we're not really doing what we have to do. Because if you have, keep doing uh, what they call it, for fair classes, hairdressing classes, and all this, the market is full of those classes or cooking classes. So we have to show them that the opportunity of doing the other classes and they can do it. So we really were successful to move good number who, of ladies who participated in those classes to other classes. We had somebody who went to mechanic, she did not continue, but at least she tried to discover. And we had somebody that carpentry, she continued the class. 
uh, but it doesn't have to do the actual job, but we give her the market access in that, this kind of business. And I think that's really good. And that's why we have to do orient orientation because in some culture, it's very close. They don't even, I mean, they cannot choose outside the, their bubble. Yeah. I, I think your your AirPods need to be charged. The the sound is a bit muffled. I mean, I'm joking, oh, but it's sorry. hard. But no, no, but it's it's mostly clear. I just want to repeat it so I understand it. Others. So basically, if you would offer several different classes for skills like um, uh, hairdressing and um, also mechanic and some others, you would ensure that everyone must or had the option to see the uh, the other classes. Was it required or just kind of like optional? If you're doing hairdressing, no, you can also I mean, okay, but encouraged no, no, maybe. It's optional. Yeah, encouraged. Okay, I I kind of like that idea. It's like you know, in university, when you're required to take courses that you may not think you like, and then you take it and you say, oh, I actually am good at this and I enjoy it. So, okay, um, yes. Oh, Patricia, right behind me. Go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think another important point of this, let's call it more innovative uh, income generating activities, for example, in the case of uh, South Sudan, and it is a pity that you cannot share it, um, linked to the floating gardens, there was some uh, awareness sessions that the women themselves were organizing on radio programs. So they received training on, on climate change, and then they were um, able to adapt those uh, materials and contextualize them to be able to share uh, with the community on, on radio programs, uh, which really, really uh, empowered them. Like, um, yeah, they were very happy about being able to, to have that role in the community. And just, well, we should finish the story of the floating gardens for everyone. We have pictures on our social media, but they built one floating garden as a pilot. It's like maybe the size of several tables put together, which floats and they built it and it requires like using plants as a base and dirt and everything. And then a big storm came and it disappeared. It was destroyed, it was washed away. So disappointment, but the women have said they want to rebuild it, do it again, and they won't you know, stop until they're able to actually eat the results uh, that are planted in those gardens. So um, they really like the idea so much that even a big setback has kind of not uh, not deterred them or discouraged them. OK, uh, I don't see any other hands. Last chance, but uh, thank you so much for coming to listen to to us and more importantly for you for participating. Uh, those of you who shared. Um, yep, yeah, Kristen's not here. I don't know how to stop the recording. Uh, I guess after we all leave, it will stop. Uh, if anyone else knows, please, please share. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. I guess we'll see each other next month, right? Thanks, I will everyone. be sharing some of the um, oh. Women Participation Project uh, links in the um, in the chat from social media. Okay, so we are posting in in LinkedIn and Instagram and uh, Twitter or X or however it's called. Um, so I will be putting some of them in the in the chat so you can actually follow the, uh, the story you. on the on the floating gardens. <laughs> Thanks. OK, yes. See you guys. Thanks for coming. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.